Good afternoon. I'm Michael Lynn coming to you from Oberlin Conservatory in Oberlin, Ohio. Uh, I have taught historical flutes and recorders here at Oberlin for 43 years. And uh, last uh, yesterday was my last day uh, before retirement. So this is my first day of retirement and here I am with some of my flutes to talk to you about the history and development of the flute. Um, this is an amazingly big topic and as one um, who has been exploring these different types of flutes over the last uh, quite a few years, uh, but seriously collecting flutes for the past 10 years or so, I can say that there are almost an infinite variety of different flutes. Um, if we think about it in relation to our modern flute world, pretty much all flutes are based on the same general idea. And if you pick up one flute, you know the fingerings and, and you can play it. And the embouchure hole, you might like one better than another, but you can play on pretty much any flute. They're, they've been highly standardized. In the early days of the flute, it was the opposite of that. Um, every country had their own predilections. Uh, uh, for instance, the, the English, especially once we get to the 19th century when things really go crazy with flute development, uh, the English preferred a flute with a very strong sound. Um, loudness was a very, very important to them. Um, they still wanted to be expressive. Uh, they wrote things that had to be very soft, but the loudness of the flute was critical. And as, as I'll mention later, uh, that has um, an important uh, part of Boehm's decision to make the Boehm flute. So in France, uh, on the other end of the scale, they were mostly concerned about making a flute that was sweet. Uh, it did not have to be loud. They, the most important thing was the flute having a sweet sound, uh, generally playing quite effortlessly up into the high register. Uh, the German flutes, uh, which I'll, I'll go into in a lot more detail as we go on here, but the German flutes were aiming at kind of a rounder, a little bit more colorful sound, uh, sort of in between in a way the, the French and the, uh, the English style. And Italian flutes uh, mostly were copying uh, the Viennese school of flute making. And American flutes, which I'll talk about in particular a little bit, uh, were often uh, based on English designs, occasionally on German designs, but usually English. But they had their, their own ideas about flute making, um, and you'll be able to hear some of that later. So as I talk through these flutes, um, I have recorded examples for you to hear of about, about 15 or 16 different flutes. Um, and uh, you know, hopefully those will be interesting and enjoyable to listen to. So one of the important things to know about the development of the flute is that most of the changes that happen as you look across this table are, uh, are evolutionary changes. They, they took one design, they added a new key, they changed the bore a little bit, they changed the shape of the embouchure, but they're evolutionary changes. And there were two points in the history of the flute where there were revolutionary changes, where instead of just making these little, little tweaks and additions, they completely changed the flute. The first one of those was moving from the Renaissance flute to the three-part Baroque flute. Uh, you will hear now uh, an example of the Renaissance flute played by a consort uh, with Boaz Bernie. Uh, and uh, you'll hear the, the Renaissance flute is an extremely refined instrument. It was meant to play in consort and uh, it has a beautiful sound. It can be played absolutely perfectly in tune with pure intervals, which was, was the idea at that time. Uh, so enjoy this little example. Thank you. 
Now, the revolution came about. Um, it is normally attributed to the Auditeur family in France. Uh, I think we don't have any really good reason to argue with that idea. Um, but what they did was they took the Renaissance flute, which was basically a cylindrical body, a single piece with no key, and they made it into three pieces, a head, a body, and a foot. And each of those could be reamed uh, differently, allowing the bore of the flute to be much more complex. And the addition of the key uh, has a lot of benefits. It, it allows you to play a D sharp, which you couldn't do so easily on the Renaissance flute. But it also allows many, many other things, um, including playing in the high register uh, more easily. So on a flute like this, the head joint is mostly cylindrical, but the body is conical. So from here on out, really, until the invention of the, the uh, cylindrical boom flute, pretty much all flutes are conical flutes. That's an important thing to realize. Also, all flutes, um, especially all, all, all sort of normal flutes, are in the key of D. Uh, the idea of the C flute came considerably later. But so a flute like this, the bottom note is a D. Now, if you have perfect pitch, you might be saying, well, that's not a D, that's a C. And that's because this flute is pitched at A392, in other words, a whole step below modern pitch. Uh, the the Early Baroque, especially the French flutes, were quite low in pitch. Uh, usually uh, A equals 400 would be about the highest pitch. And that went on into the 18th century. Uh, so regarding how these were developed, it's interesting that we find early examples of the three-piece flute also coming from Holland. Uh, and, uh, and there's at least one example that's in Italy. Some people think it was made in Italy. I, I think we don't actually know. Um, but seemingly at the same time that Auditeur, the Auditeur family was coming out with this design, other people were experimenting too. We don't, we don't really know how that all came about. But they're very beautiful instruments. Um, they're meant to, um, to feature the low register of the flute. And if you look at the early French repertoire of Auteter or de la Bar, you'll see that it's, it virtually never goes beyond a range of two octaves. And it spends a lot of time down at the bottom. And that ha has a very rich sound, and it's uh, an important uh, stamp uh, to the quality of those flutes. As we progress into the 18th century, the flute gets, again, a little more sophisticated, but this is just an evolutionary change. So now the flute um, has four joints. We have a head joint, we have a left hand joint, we have a right hand joint, and a foot joint. 
This was important for the same reasons as going to three parts. It allowed these individually to be bored uh, with different shapes. And often the, the bore down here gets uh, more thin than, than the amount of taper in this joint. And also the foot joint has to be adjusted so that the low note, uh, low D, is more or less in tune. Now, uh, to understand the Baroque flute and to understand many of the developments here, you have to, under to know a little bit about the characteristics of the sound of the Baroque flute. So first of all, the Baroque flute, as I mentioned, is in the key of D. And what that means is if I play a D major scale, I can just lift up one finger at a time. I'm going to switch to my flute that I play more regularly here. So the Baroque flute's really easy, right? You just lift up one finger at a time. The problem then is that every other note that's not in the D major scale requires some kind of complicated fingering because we don't have a key for our G sharp um, because there's not a hole here to play a G sharp. So uh, what the result of that is that the quality, the tone quality of all the different notes changes um, depending on the note that you're playing. This is kind of the opposite of the goal of the modern flute where the idea is for everything to be well homogenized and kind of seamlessly going from one sound to the other. The Baroque flute doesn't really do that. So if I play an A and a G sharp, or B and A sharp, or even F sharp and F. So they, they're not only softer, they have a different quality. And uh, as we will see, uh, that was considered a very desirable aspect of the Baroque flute. One of the things that it means is that playing in different keys uh, gives the music a different color in a way that playing in a in an equal tempered flute that is very, very even, you don't, you really can't tell very well. You can tell a little bit, but you can't tell very well about what key you're playing in. And as you'll see uh, later, this was really important in the invention of the keys, both for the reason they put on the keys and also uh, for uh, the things that people didn't like about the keys. So some other examples of the Baroque flute that, that I brought along, just to tell you what they are. So, this, so the, the first flute uh, is this, which is a copy of a flute of Otter made by Rod Cameron. A uh, very, very beautiful flute pitched at 392. Uh, the next flute would be one of the earliest four joint flutes. And this is by the famous French maker Naust. This pitch, uh, flute is pitched at A400. It's a very beautiful instrument. The, uh, the original of this flute is in the Siegel Music Museum in South Carolina, which is a museum uh, where I'm on the board of advisors and I'm looking forward to working with their fantastic flutes. Two of my favorite Baroque flutes um, are the I.H. Rotenberg model, so this is the father of G. Rotenberg, which is the, a flute very commonly used. Um, this one is pitched at A392. It's a nice low French pitch. And the other flute, which is really my main instrument these days, is a model uh, by Buffardin. This is a copy made by Martin Venner. And, um, the Buffardin flute, there's only one original Buffardin flute known, and uh, I had the great opportunity to get to see that flute and play on it a little bit, as well as on the various copies that people have been making. And it's a wonderful flute. Uh, one of the reasons why I'm so excited about it is that 
Buffardin was someone who had connections to the Bach family. So besides being a real hot shot flutist, he was sort of the number one flutist in Dresden. Um, and we know that Bach visited Dresden in 1718 and then the A minor partita and the uh, E minor, or, yeah, E minor sonatas appeared. Um, so it's quite possible that uh, Bach met Buffardin and became acquainted with somebody who was a virtuoso flute player because certainly it's possible that he had not met anyone before 1818 in Germany who was a virtuoso. Uh, we also know that in 1724, Buffardin visited Leipzig, uh, visited Bach in Leipzig, and during uh, a period of about three months, Bach wrote a series of his most amazing flute parts for Bach cantatas. And rather than being parts for two flutes, like he normally would write, these are all solo flute pieces. So I think um, it's fairly safe to speculate that Buffardin was the one who played these. And so to have a copy of a flute by Buffardin, um, if you're interested in Bach and, and his surroundings, I think is a, is a wonderful opportunity. final one is an original flute by Potter. Uh, this was made in uh, probably 1750 to 1760. It's a, it's a real um, late Baroque flute and it's made of ivory. The uh, materials used in flute making are, are very interesting uh, as well as the flute itself and Ivory, uh, in this case, this ivory has no cracks in it. It's, it's really in the same condition that it would have been in the 18th century. It has a, a very nice sound. Um, demonstration of this flute uh, in a couple of minutes. Many of the flutes that, uh, that people think of as Baroque flutes and, and that people play on regularly as Baroque flutes are, are really classical flutes. And that includes the, the Palanca flute, 
This is a Palanca model. Um, this is probably the most popular Baroque flute uh, in use today in the 21st century. Uh, people like it a lot because it's very versatile, it's very easy to play, um, and, uh, but it really is not really a Baroque flute. It's really kind of leaning into the classical period. Um, and the, the other model that, or the other two models that people use a lot are the uh, Grenzer flutes, which many makers have made over the years, uh, and also the, uh, the Rotenberg flute, the Bartkak and Rotenberg flute, which really is from the 1760s, not from before 1750. So I, I urge those of you who, who play on these later flutes, especially if you want to play early Baroque music, um, you should look into some of the, the, the models that are really Baroque models. And so that would be things like, um, like I.H. Rotenberg, uh, the father, Naust, Bouffardin, Oteter, Ripper, uh, Stainsby from England. There, there are many really fine flutes that are actually based on originals from the first half of the 18th century. So what happens uh, in the second half of the 18th century? If, if you look at this flute and you look at this flute, they look pretty much the same, they're different material. Uh, but internally, this has changed a lot. So this is a flute by a Leipzig maker, Krohn. Uh, it probably dates from 1770 to 1780. So this is a, a CPE Bach flute, is how I think of it. It plays CPE Bach quite beautifully. It's actually kind of an, uh, an intimate instrument, and, uh, and you'll hear a demo of that later. Um, so the thing that changed is the style of writing for the flute for various reasons, which I think are fairly easy to think about. The, uh, the des desirability of being able to play high became important. When, when Auditeur was, was making his flutes, the object was to have it be low and rich. But in the classical flute, the idea was for it to be transparent and light uh, and be able to play in a facile way up high. Um, people who are used to playing on the Baroque flute, uh, I experienced this myself in my youth, and suddenly you have to play a Mozart piano concerto, you'll realize that the technique involved on the instrument and the way the instrument works is completely different. That's, they're not the same animal. So they do this by having the bore get smaller, more conical, that, uh, and changing some things in the voicing, but the result is the flute can play up high and it has kind of a livelier sound instead of a dark, subdued sound. Uh, a couple of other original ones that I brought along. This is by the very famous uh, French maker Proudhon. This flute uh, has three middle joints. One of the, the, the big issues in those days was that pitch was not standardized, and if you traveled from one city to the next, or if you went from the church down the street to the castle on the edge of town, the pitch might be different, and so you needed different lengths of middle joint. Um, Proudhon is likely, well, he was especially famous as a bassoon maker, and uh, it, it's supposed that many of Rameau's 
bassoon parts would have been played on Proudhon bassoons and certainly also could be the case with the flute. The final kind of chapter of, of the classical flute and the, the beginning of the romantic flute is, is where we start having keyed flutes. So this is an eight key flute, uh, probably dates, uh, the original dates from around uh, 1790. So this is, the original is by August Grenzer. This is a copy by Martin Venner, very beautiful flute. Um, and uh, so this is an example of, of the evolution of the flute again, adding these keys. And I will talk about that in detail in a moment. I wanted to take uh, a moment to talk about uh, one of the things that I really enjoy about studying these old flutes, which is matching up repertoire and instruments. Uh, if, if you were a French flutist and living in Paris, you would have played on a French flute. There's almost no question. I mean, people who collected flutes and bought a lot of flutes might get other flutes. And if you traveled a lot, you know, you went to, you went to England, you might buy an English flute while you were there. But in general, the countries really stuck to the instruments that they liked. And uh, you know, one thing that that us early flute players have to think about is what kind of flute um, would Beethoven have been using because it's certainly very popular now to play the music of, of Beethoven's time and of course later on original flutes. So this kind of flute, this would be appropriate for early Beethoven. And uh, uh, you normally would have a C foot. This one has only a D foot. In, in those days, as well as now to some extent, you could buy a flute with however many keys you wanted. But the fully tricked out version of this flute would have been an eight key flute. And um, so this was the early flute, but by the late Beethoven, we would have had a flute like this. This is by Koch, famous Viennese maker. Um, he made truly, truly amazing instruments. There were a number of Viennese builders who really kind of set the course for, for this, this type of flute. This is a copy, again, by Martin Venner. And you'll notice this is longer. It goes down to low B, and that was a common thing on Viennese flutes. So we know, in fact, that the flute, one of the flutists in Beethoven's Ninth Symphony played on a Koch flute. So this is, this is probably, um, if anything, this is from a little bit after Beethoven died, but if you were a flutist, you, you could have been playing an earlier version of this flute, or if you're playing Beethoven 15 years after he died, this would be a fantastic flute. So to see the, uh, the individual keys and how they developed, uh, the one key is pretty much the same on all of the one key 
flutes and and even when we get to these later flutes even when we get to the later flutes the one key has the same function and pretty much the same design so there was uh, a little bit of uh, interest in the idea of a two-key flute, which uh, Johann Joachim Quantz invented, and that had two keys next to each other, uh, one for D sharp and one for E flat, and it also allowed you to have better enharmonic tuning of the other notes. It didn't really catch on in, in a big way, but it was a, an interesting experiment. In later flutes, we often see the one key mounted on uh, some kind of a post, a post and an axle, but it has the same function. It's just mounting in a more modern fashion. Now, the, the extra keys that came along, so we had the D-sharp key. The first key, I think, that people were interested in was the B-flat key, which you play with your thumb. So um, you're playing an A and you press down the key. And then the G sharp key, which is here. And the short F key, which is this one. So that for that I play an E and then play the key. That key is also used to play F sharp because F sharp is traditionally quite flat on these flutes and adding this key makes it higher. So the tuning is very good using that. The, uh, the next key was the C key played with the right hand we'll call it the next key is the long f key which uh, was to make it easier to get from the f back to the d and vice versa if if, if we just have our finger in the using using this key we have to hop and obviously you cannot do that slurring so they invented a duplicate version of the F, which you play with the left hand instead of the right hand. So that does exactly the same thing, but it allows you to play from E to D. Just moving back and forth. Now, The other thing that was added was the C foot. So that has our, our D sharp key, but it also has C sharp and C. And you'll notice um, that the design of the C foot was not at all standardized. There are many, many different ways to do it. Um, so two of my favorites, this is more or less like a modern one. This is really unusual because the finger has to move down instead of up to get the C sharp and C. And, um, and this one is, is especially rare. So you have your D sharp, C sharp, C. This flute even has a tiny little roller on the C sharp to help you move across there. This actually works kind of well. Um, the most standard version later on is this arrangement where the C sharp and C are above the D sharp. They're, they're often hard to reach, at least if you're not really used to playing with the C foot. Now, interestingly, when these keys were first introduced uh, in England, uh, they were called trillers. And uh, I think it, it's quite clear, even from looking at fingering charts, that they didn't expect, when the keys were first invented, they didn't expect you to use them all the time. The flutes retained the ability to play with the regular Baroque fingerings, or you could use the key 
uh, for a trill or for some time when you wanted a louder note. Now they didn't stop um, with, with eight keys, although eight keys was the standard flute. In England they called it the concert flute. I think that normally meant the eight key flute. Um, as, as things went on, so I mentioned uh, that this Koch flute has, uh, has nine keys. So the ninth key is the addition of this B key. But things could get really crazy, um, especially in, in Vienna and, uh, and also in Italy, where they were enthusiastic about the Viennese designs. Um, so this flute, I don't know, it has 15 or 16 keys. So one of the things that the Germans and the Viennese liked was to have duplicate keys. So instead of having to play the B flat with my thumb, I can play the B flat with this finger. So the idea kind of came about that you wanted to be able to play most notes either using your left hand or your right hand. And then this flute goes down to C, B, B flat. So this goes down to B flat. That's not so unusual. And in fact, the Viennese made flutes that went down to A and even flutes that went down to G. In fact, I think that we know that the flutist who played in Beethoven's Ninth Symphony was playing on one of these flutes that went down to G. They're like this long. They weigh a million pounds, and they're extremely hard to play down there. The idea was that those flutes could play violin music. That was, that was the reason why they uh, decided to go down to G. Unfortunately, they were so difficult to play, and they often didn't work. Uh, like the farther down on the flute you go, the less likely the notes are to work. Um, they also added some high trill keys. There's a high E to D trill key. Um, let's see what else extra. Oh yeah, there's a, a two versions of the C key. There's a C key here to be played by the left hand as well as the C key to be played by the right hand. Uh, and there are flutes with, with even more keys than this. Um, it, it, they, they look kind of like a, a modern bassoon with all of the keys that you have to do with certain fingers. This flute is, was made by Ziegler. It's probably from about 1840. Uh, very, very beautiful. So these Beethoven flutes are basically early romantic flutes. And I wanted to show some more examples of these. These are, are, are all flutes that existed before the Böhm flute. And that's a really important thing because the Böhm flute introduction brought about various changes in the simple system flutes which were competing with them. But this is before any of that happened. Um, when you went and bought a flute, you could buy a really cheap flute or you could buy a really expensive flute, just like today. Uh, it's not so much about the material the flute is made out of, although ivory flutes were, were more expensive. And if you got silver keys, that was more expensive. Various silver rings were more expensive. Um, but another way you could buy a flute is like um, this flute here, which you can see has a whole bunch of joints to it. Um, it has three middle joints, three middle joints plus the foot, the right hand, and the head joint.
this flute, which is a really an amazing flute by the French maker Tribert. This flute has three middle joints and two foot joints. It has a D foot as well as a C foot. And uh, that was not so uncommon. If you bought a fancy flute, you could buy both. Frankly, the, in many of the early flutes, they simply work better if they have a D foot on it. And the French flutists didn't uh, play a C. They, their flutes went down to D and their music went down to D. You'll, you'll see many times um, it, it's kind of a, a new and special thing when uh, flute music starts having a C in France. And often it's because they're exporting their music to England where everybody liked to play uh, down to C. But anyway, so it gives you the choice of having a C foot or a D foot. <clears throat> Some people made really extravagant flutes. This is a flute that was sold by uh, the flutist Louis Drouet. Drouet was born in Holland, uh, but spent a lot of time in France, and I think France was his main influence. He liked French style flutes that had a very sweet sound, and, and he was famous for playing in the high register very sweetly. He was clearly a, a good businessman. He toured, he literally toured uh, all around the world. He came to the United States. Uh, and, uh, and in 1821, he decided that he was gonna make his own line of flutes, which he would sell in London. And this is uh, a beautiful example of one of these flutes. It's basically made to be visually as fancy as it could be made. The, the lettering here and down here is all little silver dots stuck into the wood. And uh, it has a serial number of 68. It has a very unusual foot joint. Um, I actually just got this back from restoration yesterday, but uh, we'll play you a short example on it so you can hear the sound.
Theobald Böhm was visiting England and went to hear the flutist Charles Nicholson play. And he was amazed by how loud Nicholson's playing was. And he went and talked with Nicholson and saw his flute and I'm sure tried his flute. <clears throat> and Nicholson was famous for, for his very strong playing. And one of the ways that he accomplished that was by having quite large finger holes. Most of these uh, ones that I've shown you here, they have pretty small finger holes. Uh, but the, the English had a particular style of flute making with large finger holes and a large embouchure hole, and it made a lot more sound. And that got Boom to thinking, is there a way that I could create a flute that has a completely different sound uh, and different uh, fingerings along with it um, that would be louder and would be uh, less changes between notes? And so he, in 1832, introduced the conical boom flute. Many modern flutists don't realize that the, that the, the boom flute actually has two distinct categories, not just metal flutes and wooden flutes, but conical flutes and cylindrical flutes. Nowadays, um, I think, Pretty much no modern flute player plays on a conical boom flute. But these were what he introduced uh, as his first flute. Uh, he traveled around Europe and looked for interest in his flutes. He sold some as he traveled around. Um, he impressed people greatly who heard him play. He was a very good flutist. I'm sure he, he must have been very flashy and he could play his instrument really well. The problem was that he would then, the, his flutist who was listening would say, well, can I try that flute? And they would pick it up and try it. And, and they would realize that they were kind of having to start over again if they wanted to play the boom flute. There were a number of fingering problems that, that boom uh, kind of brought to bear. Number one, boom insisted that his flutes be made with an open G sharp. Uh, I know there are players still who like the open G sharp and, and it does have a, a very good sound, but most modern flute players will, will be upset if they have to play on an open G sharp flute. And it was the same with players of that time. So, so on Boehm's flute, actually I have, I have one here that plays this way. So if I want to play, uh, if I want to play a, a G natural, I have to put down the G sharp key to play a G natural. And if I want to play a G sharp, so it's entirely backwards from the way that we're used to doing it. That was a big stumbling block for people. And the other thing was that what had been an F sharp for all of time, and every flute before it, which is this one finger, is suddenly an F, and an F sharp is over here somewhere. That that was kind of mind-boggling to people, and um, and the different activities for the thumb, different way that the the B B flat or B key, as it started off only as one one key, um, but anyway, these fingerings, and the other thing was that boom kind of redesigned the shape of the embouchure hole. It was larger, it was more square, it was, it had a little, little bit of um, under, this, this flute has it, it's, this is indented here. So the lip sits lower and the air goes more across the hole than what they were used to on these kind of flutes. So anyway, there were not a lot of people who, who like these flutes. And Boom, <clears throat> Boom was really not interested in being a flute maker. His goal was to travel around and visit other flute makers and get the flute makers interested in making his flutes. And uh, finally, in uh, 1836, around, he was visiting in France and he got um, a couple of very fine companies in France interested in his flutes. The primary one was 
was uh, Goffa, uh, who worked with Louis Lott, and uh, they were kind of the famous makers of the flutes. Uh, Goffa, um, before he worked with Louis Lott, made the conical flute, and he was basically the first one in the world to <clears throat> mass produce a Bohm flute. Um, this flute is by the maker uh, uh, Bouffet Jeune, working together with a crazy guy named Victor Koch. And this, this flute has a huge and very interesting history to it, which I don't really have time to tell you all of it, but um, the, the real fast version is that Koch was a young hotshot flutist and he wanted to be the person who managed the sales of all Böhm flutes. <clears throat> and he tried to get Böhm to give him the rights to do that and Böhm didn't like him. He then went to the Academy of Science and showed them this flute, which he had helped invent, and said, now this is the improved Böhm flute. And he wrote a treatise on his new improved Böhm flute. Finally, uh, the <clears throat> what was needed was for the Paris Conservatory to adopt the Bohm flute. So they had a competition uh, with Mr. Toulou, who was the head of the flute department, Carobini, who was the head of the school, <clears throat> and these three young players of this flute. In the end, they rejected the Bohm flute. They, the different players played on different types of Bohm flutes. They were too different from one another, so the Parisian uh, conservatory wanted something more standardized. Uh, so the, the Bohm flute wasn't allowed to be taught there until 1860 when Toulou died. So the very beginning of, of the Bohm flute was kind of a tumultuous event in France. And in France was the place that took the Bohm flute the most seriously. What, uh, what actually allowed the Bohm flute to become fashionable and allowed people to be willing to play them was that the French flute makers um, rejected some of Bohm's ideas. So the idea of the open G sharp, um, there are a few examples, you could buy one with an open G sharp, but basically everybody had a, kind of a regular G sharp. And also, they made the embouchure hole just like the embouchure hole on their other flutes. That way, um, a French flutist could buy one of these flutes and they could pick it up and they could make a nice sound right off the bat. That made a huge difference in the acceptance. And so once the, the G sharp was straightened out, people still had to get used to the difference between F and F sharp, and of course, lots of other little things. But it was much easier for people to accept than Bohm's actual design. So, so the Goffa um, flute, um, w of which this is not, um, was really the, the first mass produced Bohm flute and it, it was pretty successful. They, they made well up in the thousands.
1847, Bone went back to the drawing board, um, thinking that he could again improve the flute uh, vastly. And at that point, he came out with the cylindrical bone flute, which is basically what we know today. He, um, they were very commonly made in wood, but the French makers, uh, Louis Lot in particular, specialized in making them from silver or even gold, other, other precious metals. Uh, and these took off pretty well. People loved the sound of it. Uh, they, especially if they'd already played the conical bone flute, they knew the fingerings and it just was easier to play. It had a bigger sound. It was more even. Um, it was, you know, it fit very well with the age that it came in. And uh, you'll hear examples played on uh, a flute by Bohm and Mendler, uh, a flute by Louis Lot, and a flute by Lefebvre. The, uh, the Louis Lot is, is a silver flute, as is the Bohm and Mendler, and the Lefebvre is a, a wooden flute. Those are played for us by uh, Joseph Monticello, who I thank very much for helping with this. Boom flutes, from the playing standpoint, are not my specialty, um, but they are his, and <clears throat> so he's made these wonderful examples for us. Greetings, fellow flutists and flute enthusiasts. My name is Joe Monticello, and it is a great pleasure to be joining you and Michael Lynn in this overview of the history of the flute. Today I'm going to be presenting the early Bohm flute and to do so I have three fantastic instruments just waiting to be played behind me. Uh, before I dive in though I'd like to extend a thank you to Michael Lynn for allowing me to take part in this lecture and also a huge thank you to Phil Unger and the incredible team at the Flute Center of New York for providing both the Bohm and Mendler and Louis Lott flutes on display in today's video. To start, I will be playing the Bohm and Mendler. Um, Bohm was, of course, the father of the modern flute making method, and this particular flute is no exception. It is a seamed silver tube with an open G sharp, a pre bridgeshell D thumb key, which means the B natural is on the left and a B flat lever appears on the right, as well as a 14 karat gold lip plate and riser. Um, this flute, like many of Bohm's inventions, do play, does play it at quite a high pitch. Um, for my lip, it's about 448. For others, it may be closer to 450 or 452. Um, but um, I think you'll be able to hear some special qualities in this instrument, and certainly a vast difference from the earlier conical flutes. Um, to showcase this instrument, I've chosen a snippet from the Andante by Bohm, Opus 33. Uh, of course, I have no piano with me, but... Uh, I hope that you'll be able to get a sense for this beautiful instrument as it is.
Moving across the continent of France, I'd like to now introduce a beautiful flute from the private collection of Michael Lynn. This instrument, made by Lefebvre of Paris, is in coccus wood with a nickel or silver plated mechanism. It is a very beautiful and delicate keywork, as we come to uh, expect from the French makers. Um, in line G, open hole, closed G sharp, and a low B foot, which was less than common to find at the time, but certainly did exist. Um, as you will notice, uh, contrary to silver flutes or perhaps modern wooden flutes, this does not have a lip plate. Um, it makes for a much more organic feel, and it really does show a lovely connection between the older fashion of flutes and the modern school of bell flute making. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to play the Morceau de Concours of Foray on both this flute and the Silver Louis Lot, which I will play in just a few minutes, so that you have an opportunity to compare and contrast the two sounds of the cylindrical Boehm flute that were floating around Paris throughout the 19th and 20th century, very much side by side. Enjoy. The third and final flute I'll be presenting today, I have here a Louis Lot on loan from the Flute Center of New York. This is a beautiful instrument, um, dating from 1922. The serial number is 9158. Um, it is an all silver flute, closed hole, inline G, C foot, and this flute has never been retuned. It has not appeared to have the head joint shortened. The embouchure hole is completely original. This flute essentially is just as it was when it left the Atelier in Paris in 1922.
I wanted to mention briefly about American flutes because as we, most of us live in America, we might run into these flutes at antique stores and other places. Um, American flutes, uh, maybe even more than European flutes, kind of have a range from very cheap, like a flute for a dollar, to flutes that, that were expensive, that basically a, a rich person would buy. And um, so when we find flutes at an antique store, uh, people often assume it's going to be a really good flute. But unfortunately, because so many of these $1 and $2 flutes were sold, a lot of the flutes are of that type. This is actually a beautiful example of a simple American flute, and, and you'll hear an example in a minute. Um, this flute was actually not made to be able to play in F natural. They just decided, you know, you want to play tunes, you play tunes in F sharp, or with an F sharp. So you wouldn't play this flute in an orchestra, but you might play it with your local guitar and, and pianist to, to play tunes. And they do have a, a beautiful sound. The other thing to know about these uh, these one key flutes in particular, people often see them and think, oh, it's a Baroque flute because it has one key. But they really can't, they don't really play Baroque music well. On a classical flute, if you find a flute from the 1770s, you could play Baroque music on it, but not one from the 1850s. Uh, another very nice thing, um, and I demonstrate this briefly, is, uh, they really liked this size of flute called a, a terz flute, a, th a third flute. And the idea was it's a third above D, so it's a flute, a flute in F. And these were quite popular. They were played in, uh, in bands a lot. Uh, they could play clarinet parts because the lower range of the clarinet was in, in a similar fingering style. And they really have a, a great sound. And um, the American maker Pelube made this one. And I, I've had a couple of F flutes by him. And they're just you know, super beautiful flutes.
The last thing I wanted to mention also because this is the kind of thing that you might run into in an antique store is this type of flute, which is called a Nachmeyer flute. Uh, sometimes they will say on the Nachmeyer, sometimes it just says Meyer, sometimes it says Hanover. Basically, there are knockoffs. There, there was a famous flute maker uh, named Meyer in Hanover, <clears throat> and people adapted his design and made basically a, a very cheap uh, flute out of it. And these uh, were exported by probably the hundreds of thousands to the US and other places. Some of them can actually be really good, but some of, some of them are terrible. Uh, they did not have a lot of value unless they happen to be really good and are in great shape. <clears throat> the first time somebody gave me one of these, they said, oh, here, I'm gonna give you this because it's the kind of flute that Mozart played. I said, well, it's off by 100 years, but that's okay. So anyway, these flutes were made into the 20th century. They, uh, they, they were just like the cheapest flute. If, if uh, you could buy one of these for a few dollars, whereas a silver flute would cost a hundred dollars. Big, big difference. So they often uh, have ivory head joints. The, the things to look for to know it's a Meyer or a Nachmeyer is it has a metal cap and a metal foot, which fell off of this one. Uh, and the G sharp key is slanted. As Soon as you see that, you know you're in that category. Now, this one is a real Meyer flute. This is a fancy, fancy flute. It looks very similar. It has the metal end. This one has, it has a different kind of end. Um, it's a beautiful ivory head. This one has silver keys instead of German silver. Um, and these are fine, very fine flutes. <clears throat> these are really good for late 19th century uh, music. And in, in Germany, people kept playing on these simple system flutes in orchestras in, into the 20th century. I should mention that the conical drum flute kept on going even though the cylindrical flute was introduced. We often think, and, and I remember thinking this myself when I got started studying old flutes, that once something new was invented, uh, everybody stopped using the old thing, but that's entirely not what happened. People, more likely people like to stick with what they knew how to do. 
And so young players would pick up the boom flute, older players would keep playing on simple system flutes. And just to show a kind of neat example, these are two flutes made by Bouff Bouffet Crampon, company that's still in existence, um, not uh, owned in the same way, but, uh, but the company name and, and a version of the same logo still exists. So these two flutes were made basically at the same time. This is a 10 key simple system, and this is a very complex uh, conical boom with a B foot, which is really quite, quite unusual. So a flutist could, in, in 1880 or 1890, could have been playing on either one of these flutes. These were both professional level flutes uh, for their time. One of the other things that happened when the boom flute was introduced is that the makers of the simple system flute uh, tried to figure out ways to make the simple system flute have some of the nice features of the boom flute but without <clears throat> becoming a cylindrical flute. And the most successful and, and rare and valuable of these is uh, an instrument called the flute perfectionné which was uh, invented by Toulou, the famous flutist, uh, and Nonon, who worked with him. Uh, this is a, a Nonon flute perfectionné. They have many unusual features that the thing most obvious right away is that we have rods and axles and clutches and things like that that only the boom flute uh, normally would have. Uh, he, he does lots of interesting things. The, there's a C key for the thumb as well as, as the B flat. Um, he has new and different uh, trill keys. This one, this one goes down to B, which is quite rare in this type of flute. But these made a very beautiful sound. It was a, a very, very classy flute. Um, it certainly could compete um, completely well with the conical boom flute, which I think is really what it was intended to do. Other makers um, in England in particular, they did a lot of crazy things where they, uh, where they would make um, a simple system flute and put it on a conical bore, uh, or they would have a simple system flute with keys that looked like a boom system but wasn't really a boom system, that used, used the old-fashioned fingerings but you were using Closed, closed keys instead of your fingers. Um, <clears throat> so there were there were many different attempts to compete uh, with the boom system. I wanted to say one other thing, uh, which is about the materials that these flutes are made from. The black flutes are either ebony or granadilla, or sometimes just called African black wood. Um, in the earlier times, ebony <clears throat> was not so rare, um, and, uh, but people did also use grenadilla. Then uh, the next most common is boxwood. So these light colored flutes are boxwood. Um, and then as I mentioned previously, there's ivory. And then there's a wood, um, wood called cocos wood, which some people call rosewood, but it is, is not rosewood, at least generally it's not rosewood. Cocos is, is a different family. So those were the most, most common woods. And in the 19th century, in particular, cocos became a very, very common wood. It, the reason people liked it is because it didn't warp and uh, boxwood and some of these other woods warp quite a bit. And um, then, of course, when we get to the silver flutes, we have uh, uh, German silver, we have uh, uh, regular silver, gold, all kinds, of, all kinds of different possibilities. So at the end of all this, we get to the modern flute, which is definitely not my specialty. But from what I understand, um, the, the modern flute really comes to us because of two Louis Lott flutes that were being played in the Boston Symphony. And 
Powell and Haynes both made copies of those flutes and then worked to develop the, the more modern uh, idea of the, of the flute. Uh, one of the differences that I always notice between a Louis Lott flute and a, and a real modern flute is that the, these old flutes, the 19th century silver flutes, have an incredibly sweet and delicate and refined high register all, all the way up. Um, and they're much easier to play up there than the modern flute. The problem is they're not as loud. So kind of what, at least to me, it seems like the objective of the modern flute has been to get as loud as possible. And that's given away <clears throat> a lot of the refinement that we otherwise could hear in the, uh, in the high register. So I, I hope that's uh, given you some idea of the variety of historical flutes and that the played examples uh, you'll find interesting and enjoyable. Thanks very much for watching.